Welcome to the Big Time Strength Podcast, featuring small school strength coaches making the big time where they're at. I am your host, Gage Rozier. Today's episode is sponsored by Team Builder. Team Builder provides strength conditioning software to athletics programs around the country. Whether you write your own programs or want access to over 100 templates, Team Builder can make your program more efficient, more accountable, and smarter when it comes to measuring your team's effort in the weight room. Visit their website and start a 14-day free trial at teambuilder.com. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in this week for the Big Time Strength Podcast. This week I am honored to be joined by Coach Ron Thompson. He is the head strength coach at New Mexico Highlands University. He's in his fifth year there. And Coach Thompson was an awesome guest, and he's an awesome strength coach who has been doing it for a long time. He is a master th- strength coach recognized by the CSCCA. And I really get into a um, a lot of his experience here and really just, it really was an honor to talk to Coach because he's got so much experience. He talks about um, being an architect. He's, you know, created two or three different um, strength conditioning programs from scratch. And it was just a, a great episode and I hope you guys get a lot out of it. Okay, so for today, instead of doing a resource review, I want to introduce to you a new sponsor. So we just picked up a new sponsor, um, Optum Nutrition Athletic, and we are really excited to have them on. Uh, we use them here at Juul. We buy all of our protein through Juul to provide to our athletes, and they they provide great product at, at a really good price. And so I want to read just a little bit of a um, ad for them real quick, and then we'll get to today's episode. So... Athletes train hard to play at the highest level, and all that hard work raises the bar on muscle recovery. Optum Nutrition's athletics program has industry-leading products that can help. Protein is key to muscle recovery, and Gold Standard 100% Whey, the world's best-selling whey protein powder, provides 24 grams of protein that mixes easily with just a glass and spoon. Gold Standard 100% Whey is made in Optum Nutrition's state-of-the-art facilities in Aurora, Illinois, and is banned substance tested by Informed Choice. Through Optum Nutrition's athletic program, you can also get Pro Gainer for big athletes looking to become even bigger and ready to eat protein snacks including protein, crisp bars, cake bites, protein wafers, and protein almonds. After dominating the sports nutrition industry for over 30 years, newly created Optum Nutrition Athletics brings that same trust and quality that knows how to put convenient options for protein in the hands of athletes who desire to become bigger, stronger, and better at their sport. So thank you, thanks again to Optum Nutrition's athletic program for sponsoring our, our podcast and bringing them on board to the Big Time Strength. They they are um, here to support departments that are in like we are and that we don't have a huge budget, and they they give us the best price that you can basically ask for. Um, so I encourage you to reach out to them. Their contact info will be in our show notes. And again, once again, thank you um, for them for coming on. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in today. I hope you enjoy this episode with Coach Ron Thompson. Thanks. Hey, Coach, I really appreciate you coming on the Big Time Strength Podcast. Let's get rolling here and, and give us a little background of your, your great experience you have and where you're at right now. Okay. Uh, appreciate you asking me, Gage, to come on and uh, love to help you out. Uh, my background, uh, really, I went to uh, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, grew up in California. Uh, through college, I knew what I wanted to be, and that was a coach, and really started out thinking I'd be just a high school football and strength coach and, you know, teach, and I did. Uh, started out that way and uh, moved into, uh, uh, you know, getting to the point where I was started out in California and then moved uh, to uh, Texas and coached high school, and what happened then is the – strength and conditioning field, uh, you know, really started late seventies, early eighties, started kind of kicking in a little bit and you'd see more and more colleges, uh, hiring the person for, uh, you know, pretty much just football. And at that time, to be honest with you, there was probably, I'd say no more than 18 positions that you noticed around the country. So that really perked my interest because everywhere I was high school coaching and teaching, I was also the strength coach because of my knowledge and, you know, just having a, a real interest in it. Well, you know, I started seeing this take place across the country. So that really perked my interest and ended up going to SMU 
in the early 80s and uh, was there uh, and, you know, really got my feet wet on the college level, you might say. And fortunately, first year in, you know, we win the national championship and, you know, have players such as Eric Dickerson, Craig James, Michael Carter, and on and on. And not just football, but, you know, we had Olympians. I had 14 different Olympians that were in the 84, 88, 92 uh, Olympic Games and swimming, track and field, basketball, you name it. So fortunate, very fortunate just to walk into that situation. Um, was there until, you know, the death penalty. And I'm not sure if you're old enough to know or remember, but uh, something you might want to look up. Uh, you know, we weren't doing things quite right. And the NC2A came in and you know, just asked us all to leave. So moving from there, I went to Wyoming as an assistant and uh, went on from there to uh, Northern Colorado, uh, Marshall University, uh, back out to Boise State. And at both Marshall and Boise, I started the programs there from scratch, uh, left there, eventually ended up at uh, Purdue, was at Purdue for uh, 12 years. And uh Coach Tiller, who we were under, uh, eventually retired, and coaching changes like they do happen. And the guy that came in, he just basically ran the program into the ground, and you know we all got fired, and it's the way it works. And ended up going to Buena Vista University, a D3 school in Iowa, and started the program there. It was about the time where more and more universities were uh, having to have by NC2A legislation, you know, a certified strength coach. So at D3, it was the last school in the Iowa conference that did not have it. So I got to go in there and create a program. And it was a, you know, like most uh, D3 schools, it was a private school and, you know, had the second highest endowment in the state of Iowa. So money wasn't a problem. They wrote blank checks and I just set up a nice room and went from there. And from there, I went on to the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, And the reason I got there was just out of uh, connections, like a lot of times in this field that a basketball coach knew a guy and contacted me with my background and they needed a good guy there. They didn't have football, but had, you know, obviously their, their importance on basketball. So it kind of it drew my interest and obviously more money, that type of thing. And so I went there for two years and, you know, got them kind of turned around as far as proper training and the athletes doing better. We won the Conference of Horizon League and, you know, and then one day, to be honest with you, my wife came home. She said she's sick and tired of the cold weather in Wisconsin and our son uh, goes to Oregon State. So... um through connections, again, a coach that I worked with, a uh, football coach at Purdue, knew the coach here at uh, New Mexico Highlands. And again, never having a strength coach and needing certified people, you know, they were hiring a position for the first time. And so I thought I'd look into it because it's halfway closer to our kid in Oregon and it's a lot warmer. And we knew the area a little bit from traveling. So, uh, like I said, I looked into it. It looked like a good situation. I have a nice 6,000 square foot room that's well equipped and has has uh, gotten better through the five years I've been here with uh, updates and, uh, you know, starting a program from scratch. So it's always interesting and kind of a funny side note. A lot of my uh, colleagues through different jobs, such as Marshall, Northern Colorado, uh, Boise State, um, you know, Buena Vista, and, and then here, they call me the architect due to the fact that I've gone into quite a few programs and started from uh, scratch. So uh, that's how it led us here, and now I'm in my fifth year here. Well, that's an unbelievable background you have, and your, your experience is second to none. And I want to talk about the architect then, and that's kind of what I wanted to go next, was what are the first steps when you when you went to those places that didn't have those programs, what were your first steps in establishing uh, the program that you wanted to run? Well, like, like any of us, you know, if you're taking a job somewhere, you're, you're going to look at what you have available equipment wise space and so on and so forth. Um, and once you get that figured out, 
I feel and what I do is um, I'm not really going to, if I can, you know, and luckily everywhere I've been, it's been very adequate that I can not have to really make radical changes to what I want to do and just come in and, you know, lay the groundwork and actually implement my program uh, the way I want to do it. So in the case, in all of them, um, you know, the rooms were very adequate, obviously. And, uh, you know, like I said, I just came in and sat down and planned out what I feel I need to do and how things were going to be. And biggest thing is getting not so much the coaches on board, but never having had a strength coach, they either did it themselves or didn't do it. And from that standpoint, you have to kind of educate them on how it's going to be, like how you're going to run it. Scheduling. I mean, oh, my God, scheduling is is sometimes like hitting a brick wall because they don't understand it. They just think they can come and go as they used to. And, you know, you're putting some type of discipline and structure in organization into the program. And once it gets implemented and going, they they realize how great it is. Number one, because they don't have to do it anymore. But two, you know, their teams are getting taken care of quite well, you know. And it really, most of the places I've, I've done this, I started out with no staff. And I don't have a staff here. I'm a one-man show for 11 sports. so you have to be that much more organized, you know, structured, disciplined with everything you do as far as the room, the athletes, the coaches, scheduling, on and on and on. And, you know, once you get that in place and going, like I said, it it, it kind of takes over and, and moves, you know, by itself. And so now in this case here, uh, after five years, that's pretty much the way it is. You know, you have a few hiccups here and there, and you just, you just iron those out. And sometimes it's uh, not to the liking of some of the coaches, but, you know, you stand your ground. And I've just, you know, at this point in my career, I could care, you know, whether you like it or not. It's going to be better for your kids. Okay. My point is I'm here for your kids. You know, whether you like me or not, or you didn't like that time frame or whatever it may be, I'm going to do the best I can for your team. And I'm going to do the best for your kid. And it, it, it all works out. You know, I mean, you have those, like I said, little hiccups with certain people. And then after a while, it's all meshed and everybody's like, yeah, you know, this is, you're right. This works really well. So, you know, I, I just come in and like I said, you have to look at the situation, room, equipment, spacing, time, all these things. And then once you get that, you know, written down and figured out, you know, in my case, I've had, I've never had to really deviate from what I really wanted to do. Well, that's great. And there's a lot of great um, advice you put in there, coach. And I think obviously one of those first steps as well is going to be in establishing the culture you want and those values and behaviors you really want to drive your program. So maybe tell us a little bit about kind of that culture of your program Um how, how things kind of run? Well, um, you know, obviously like all of us, you're going to, you're going to start like, like again from scratch. And so the first time you meet, for example, with coaches and then with eventually teams, uh, you're going to lay the groundwork as far as your rules, policies, procedures, um, you know, and how things are going to be, you know, worked out and dictated basically. You know, because a lot of times you come in and if they've been left on their own, they're walking around the room with headphones on. They've got, iPod, you know, iPads, uh, you know, cell phones. And, you know, that's that's just not going to go. You know, you can't play with those. You're not going to work out with those. And so you kind of lay those down. And sometimes that's that's a thing that seems so silly. But, you know, in the case like here, that was the case. And so we just we just scrapped that and said, there, you know, this is not going to happen anymore. Then you move on and, you know, you eventually day by day, workout by workout, start building your culture as far as, you know, you want hard work. You want them to understand hard work. And in a lot of cases, when you come in to a brand new program, it, the kids aren't going to fight you. They, they understand that this is going to be better for them. And a lot of that's just the groundwork laid by the coaches previous to you walking in the door and then them meeting you and understanding how you're going to be. 
And, you know, the culture's that way. It's hard work. Uh, we're going to train you to be, you know, uh, to do the right thing for your sport, um, you know, whatever it may be. Um, you know, we're going we're gonna to institute and mentor as far as, uh, you know, the right values and doing the right thing, being, the, being a good person. You know, so much of this job nowadays, to be honest with you, which we can talk about later in one of the questions you had, is that I feel like a lot of times I'm more of a psychologist than I am a, a strength coach. And times have changed. Kids have changed. Um, you know, through the whole time I've been doing this, it's gone from one end to the other end of the spectrum. And so you, you've got to work with them on that. You've got to counsel them. You've got to have a private meeting on some issue with the coach, you know, and all these kind of things. But, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to create that culture of positive, you know, reinforcement, you know, training hard, you know, progressing through the program, uh, you know, developing everything that you need to develop within the program that's going to aid them in their sport you know, the strength, power, flexibility, functional movement, uh, you know, on and on. Sports nutrition is such a big deal now than it ever was, you know. And, you know, you just got you just got to bring these up. And it's like a daily thing. I do a thing that I've done forever. And whether, whether it's a smaller group or an entire team, I will always bring them up at the end and talk about some aspect of, uh, you know, uh, you know, character, development, doing the right thing, uh, sports nutrition talk on some aspect, and, you know, just leave them with that each and every day so that if it's a bad day, you perked them up. If it's a good day, you know, you reward them, but you're always leaving them with some type of positive and some type of information that hopefully sinks in. And, you know, a lot of times you, you see it kind of come back later and they regurgitate it. And you remember, you know, you think, okay, I said that last year, I said that last month. So, you know, they're listening, you know, and, um, you know, you just got to hit on all the different, uh, points and, uh, make sure that you're covering it. And to me, that just kind of slowly starts to develop the culture that you want. Now you also, you know, sit down with coaches and some of them are a little more specific in the way they want things. Um, you know, luckily in my case here and most I've, I've uh, been able, they've kind of left you alone, you might say, and they trust you. And so it's a matter of, you know, you're just implementing what you should be doing and making those necessary changes when you know, you need to. And, uh, you know, but I always ask for feedback and, you know, a lot of times they'll give it to you, but you, you know, you got to work with them all. So it's developing the culture with the athletes, but also from or with the coaches at the same time. Yes, absolutely. And I think, I mean, you hit on so many great points there. I don't really know where to go with it next. And I think within that culture, you obviously get a really good chance to build team camaraderie and, and develop leaders. And there's there's multiple ways to go about doing that. Have you, What are some of the ways that you've found have been very effective at you know, develop, developing that team cohesion and getting leaders to really take a more active role in, in their team's training? Well, you know, I think a big part of that comes from like a lot of things that we deal with as far as, you know, in our positions is that it, it comes from the top. So it's not only the AD, but especially the head football or basketball or baseball or whatever, the head coaches that hopefully are instituting that. And, you know, it carries right down through the staff. And so you just kind of elaborate on that. But once you get the kids going, uh, you, you zero in on those kids, that, like you pointed out, the leaders, and you try to develop them to be that more outspoken and, and, and try to get them to lead and say some things occasionally. I'll do crazy things every once in a while. I'll just out of nowhere say, okay, today at the end of the workout, you two are going to speak to the team. So it gets them because I know they can be the leader, but they haven't yet, you know, so I'm trying to get them out of their shell and trying to get them to say something that's you know, pertinent and, uh, you know, important. And then that hopefully as we progress forward, you know, they become that more outspoken, you know, type of person and uh, become the leader. Now, you know, and it also works with the coaches because they may pick the captains and then obviously those people should be your leaders. Um, different things. Uh, 
you know, I'll take a kid that sits in a corner and hides, you know, and, and doesn't really, you know, they're, they're just shy, maybe a freshman, a sophomore and, and, and somehow get them involved more. Uh, one of the things like right now in our off season, I do, I do some things to create fun and change it up, you know, rather than just, you know, the grind, 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 which it is, but like, we'll have a, a day where I'll take playing cards and I'll just have two guys from two different groups pick a card and then whatever we may be doing for that, like bicep curls, pull-ups, push-ups, or whatever, that number is the number that group has to do. And, you know, so it kind of livens it up. But I'll bring that kid out of the corner and get them involved as far as simply just pulling the card. Yeah. But then the kids do that. And so when when they – when that group that he's involved with pulls a high number card for the other group, they're all excited and they pat him on the back and he just gets more involved. So, I mean, there are so many different ways you can do it. You know, I mean, uh, those are just a few that I do. Well, I love that playing card idea. Cause that's, it's little things like that, that I'm always looking to, you know, try to mix things up a little bit. And, um, it doesn't yep. have to be super complicated. And I think that's a great idea. Might I got to, deck of cards at my desk I could do that one pretty quick so that's that's pretty good all right so you know you've been a lot of places and the funding I'm sure has been different in all types of places so um, how have you gone about acquiring additional funding whenever you've needed to for your program well you know I've gone from large budgets that you don't really worry too much about and then you know, with that large budget, every few years they come to you and you, you know, capital outlay and like you might make radical overall big changes in some pieces of equipment to where, well, I'll be honest with you here, I have no budget. And what I've done here is done the typical t-shirt sales and, you know, the, the, the cowboy strength logo and, you know, that raises money to where I over the years bought all my TRXs and little things like that, or I can go out and buy, you know, taking the PVC pipes for, you know, stretching and different, you know, things. And so simple, simple things like that. I've gotten in the first couple of years, I got a pretty good donation from Samson down here in Las Cruces. And they, we have their equipment because that's who uh, originally equipped this room. And so they were willing to help because I came in new and they knew me and, you know, they help throw some, some money our way. You just have to go out and be, you know, creative. Um, I've done, I've done raffles, you know, 50, 50 raffles at basketball games and raise, you know, any one night, if it's a decent crowd, you know, I, I might, I might raise a uh, hundred dollars or more. I mean, that doesn't seem like a lot, but it is, yeah. you know, and, and you just, you stuff that away and that buys you some chalk. It buys you whatever. You know, it's not going to buy you some big piece of equipment. But then, you know, at the same time, you've got to go to your administration and say, look, you know, I need, I need, I need. And eventually, you know, you break the wall down and they come up with something and it and it helps. It helps a lot. So, I mean, there's just different ways. I mean, I've in places I've been in the past when, you know, high school, for example, or, or, or colleges with the lower budgets, uh, car washes, yeah. uh, you know, um, you know, just different things. You can have, I mean, as simple and crazy as seeing bake sales, you know, and you get your kids all involved and, you know, that type of thing, mothers, and, you know, they'll help, they'll help you out. You know, it's just, it's just being creative. You know, it's not as easy as it seems. And, you know, not everybody, like I said, has that large budget and, you know, but I'm not, I'm a person that over the years, I've just learned that I'm not afraid to go ask somebody. So to approach, uh, Samson, for example, or anybody, you know, I mean, I'm going to try. And usually they're going to try to help you in some way, you know, from that standpoint. Well, we know we know funding can definitely be a, a challenge for a lot of small school strength coaches. But, I mean, there's there's multiple others that can, can provide some tough hurdles to cross. What are, what are some of the toughest hurdles you've had to overcome um, along your way through strength conditioning? Well, uh... Let's see. You know, I, I, I would say just off the top of my head, some of them are just like I said earlier, you've got to have, you're going to have some of those run-ins with coaches that have, 
beliefs in certain ways. And, you know, I find that some of the younger coaches, you know, that let's be honest, aren't going to, aren't winning. They, they start to look for excuses and sometimes it comes your way. And, you know, I always try to get them and maybe the AD assistant AD, somebody involved sit down and we just talk it out. And it, and it normally just works itself out that they realize that we are probably doing the right thing. It's just not blaming anybody on either side. It's something else that's, you know, occurring. Uh, those are one of the things, um, you know, lack of uh, space, maybe, you know, places you, 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 you can't, you just don't have the, the big enough or area outside to do enough of uh, outdoor activities of running and things such as that. Um, those are just some of the more common, you know, that I've, that I've run across. All right. So I want to switch the conversation a little bit and we'll talk a little bit more training. So, um, what is your, your training philosophy or your principles that you really guide your programming by? Well, real basically, um, you know, I might be a little old school, but you know, it's, it's a simple stuff. It's worked for years and, uh, you know, it's, I don't think it's going away for a while, but I, I'm a, I'm a periodization, uh, changing depending on what I need from conjugate to linear to undulating, you know, that type of, uh, training principles, applying it to where uh, I'm going to use, you know, I'm a big Olympic lifter, um, you know, especially clean, um, you know, snatches occasionally, depending on the individual, the team, what they may need. Um, to simplify it, I would say I'm really holistic. And, um, you know, you're going to get from my program for a football player, for example, uh, a better football player that can utilize all the components that we're working on and take it out on the field and utilize it. So I'm not concerned for example, that you're going to be the 500-pound bencher or 700-pound squatter or 400-pound cleaner, you're going to be good at those, but we're not worried about the numbers from that standpoint. You know, so it's going to be a well-rounded type of program. You know, we're going to institute within it a lot of functional movement. You know, we're going to create the flexibility that's needed. Um, you know, within the program, I mean, my workouts, if you were to stay here and watch uh, you know, they're going to go from some type of lift into a functional movement in between the sets. You know, I'm going to get the most bang for my buck, you know, because your time is limited. Um, the kids that we get here are division two kids, but they're honestly not sometimes the most talented. And they're coming from programs that have been very limited in what they've been taught or, you know, the amount of time they spent doing it. So their training experience, their training age is sometimes zero and, you know, not, not extremely high. If I get a kid that I would recognize coming in that had uh, a training age of, you know, four, five, six, man, we're, we're, we're talking about really extremely lucky. So, you know, that, that's basically how I go about it. Um, you know, I think that I try to stay up to date and I do, I read constantly. I'm always researching and, you know, just trying to find what is the next best thing out there, but there isn't always the next best thing. You, you know, you find that, okay, there's this, there's that, but you know, when all said and done at the end of the day, you come back and you go, you know what, we're doing it. Okay. We're doing it right. Well, that, that leads me into my next question, which is, you know, one of my challenges, which I'm sure for you as well, when you don't have a staff and you have a lot of teams and athletes, um, you know, you have athletes that are kind of on the different spectrum of, you know, development to, you know, they've gotten super strong. Now maybe they need to do something slightly different to keep improving. You know, do you have like a block level system? Um, to where you can separate your athletes out? And, and if you do, how do you manage that and organize that? Well, you know, here right now, I'd say no, because it's so new. And, you know, we're, again, the type of kid I just explained, um, we just need to work them and develop them and, you right. know, keep progressing. In other places, you run into a few. You run into a few. For example, uh, uh, one that comes to my mind is at Purdue, we had a defensive tackle, all Big Ten, 
played for the Green Bay Packers for a while. But, you know, he wanted to just lift, lift, lift. And he was extremely strong. But what we tried to get him to understand is the fact that, you know, for him to reach the next level, he's going to have to start backtracking a little bit, sacrificing something and giving up something to where, you know, we, we, we wanted to work on more functional movement, flexibility, and, you know, get him more well-rounded that way. And, uh, you know, those are the things you have to do when you find those type of athletes and, and you might have to spend time. Now, making a program, yeah, you can make a program. And, you know, what you hope you have when you're working with, like you're saying, you know, we're both one-man shows, is that in that case, if you did it, you'd have to have that athlete be mature enough to understand that they may be doing a little something different than the rest of the group, for example, or a few people. And they still have to carry it out rather than, you know, right now, I mean, most of them are doing most of the same things. And that's just because they need it. You know, we've got to be kind of redundant on it and, you know, hammer it across and just keep grinding at it and get them better. And then, you know, whether that comes or not, you might have to make a change. But, but you know, that's happened. But you, you just got – it's a rare individual in the fact that you've got, to, you've got to set them aside and, you know, change what needs to be changed and get them to understand why – because so many, you know, so many of them are stubborn in the fact that they want to keep being the biggest bencher or squad or whatever, and you can't always do that because you're sacrificing something else that's going to get you to where you're not playing because you're injured or in like this guy's case, actually when the scouts started talking to him, they told him the exact same thing we did. So, yeah, but I, I haven't found it to be that way yet here. Well, that eases my mind a little bit because I, I can get down that rabbit hole a little bit. But, you know, I think like for here, we do have one player who I think is mature enough and he's definitely strong enough. I think, I mean, he's 180 pounds, he's a corner and he's squatting over 500 pounds that we need to do something different. And I don't think we need yeah. to push him to 515 when yeah. he's no. not the fastest guy. So we're having that conversation with him and trying to get him to buy into that process. Well, you know as well as I do, kid like in that with those figures and that situation, you're talking about lack of speed and quickness and foot speed and all that kind of thing. Obviously, you're going to work on that. What you got to convince him on is that you have enough leg strength. Yeah. And strength is what propels you and, you know, the force into the ground, all of those type of things we both know, and get the kid to understand how that can make him faster. And then it's just a matter of just drills and, you know, repetitive uh, work on, you know, movement, just movement in general. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, Coach, so what is your, what is your vision for your program in the next five years? Where are you taking uh, New Mexico Highlands next? Well, um, you know, a few different things. One, I want to keep simply uh, upgrading equipment. Um, I don't, I don't foresee us getting a, a another room or bigger or adding on any any shape or form. Uh, you know, from the training standpoint, um, you know, keep getting the kids developed and and progressing to where maybe you know in that five years in the future you've got a few more of these kids we're talking about that you know, male or female that, you know, has enough of something and you kind of alter their training to, you know, fit it in a different way. Um, but realistically, we're, we're a culture here right now that has lost for so long that we're just trying to change that mentality and that work ethic and everything, and it's coming. So from that standpoint, I think that's going to be a, another, you know, one of continue to be one of the big factors is just keeping that mentality developing and understanding, winning some more games, you know, creating a better, you know, environment from that standpoint. Pretty simple, uh, nothing outrageous, you know. I'm obviously always fighting for a budget, and I think this next fall I've got the AD now realizing that after five years. You know, it's it's pretty silly that I don't have one. I'm hoping that at the same time in the conversations we're having that next fall, for example, I'm hopefully going to bring in two graduate assistants. Awesome. That's what I'm fighting for, and that's what, you know, he's understanding 
but you know how that works. Uh, everybody's sitting on pins and needles right now in the state. New, uh, you know, new government changeover. So everybody's sitting waiting to see what the state budget is going to throw towards higher education and to us in particular. So next few months, we'll get a better idea. Then maybe we have a little bit of more money and that budget can be put together and those GA positions can be put together. So those are some of the big things immediately, but moving forward in the next five years. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't try to look five years. I, I'll be honest with you in this kind of job and everything is, it's like a daily thing. It's yeah. like take one day at a time, take one week at a time and try to get through this. And then we, we got problems. Let's, let's deal with it when it, when across that bridge and, you know, solve it in some way. Yeah, it's a great mentality to have, and I, I need to remember that a little bit more myself. Um, I hope you get those those GAs. I'm sure that'd be huge for you. Um, I want to go oh, back yeah. to the. I want to go back to the. You said you know a culture of you know you guys have lost a lot of games, and unfortunately we're in the same boat. I mean we've struggled. You know with football being our main sport, we've won four games in the last three years. And uh, do you have any tips for you know your week? had all these high hopes, you think you're turning the program around, and then it's week six and we're 0-5 again, and the guys are just dragging their feet in the weight room. And um, What's your approach with the team at that point? Well, you know, one of the things that I feel fortunate about here is that I think the kids coming in and the kids that are already here know my background. They know what I've done. You know, I've got things in my office that are just mementos from other places and who I've worked with. So that, you know, that helps. That That's just, I like that, but, you know, it's more for me. But it carries over to them in the fact that, you know, you're you're 0-4 and, and you're going into week five and, you know, you, you always, always stay positive, you know. And it's hard sometimes because you see them down and you got to bring them up and you're, you're not in the best shape and, you know, mentally and, you know, that kind of thing, but you just got to fight through that and you got to stay positive. And like I said before, they, they look at me and, and, and I'm an appreciative of it in the fact that they realize that I know what I'm doing. So they, they understand that they need to continue to train. And I, and I put a positive spin on it in the fact that, you know, you do. And now you make some changes here and there to kind of perk them, you know, like, uh, I mean, as simple as maybe one day we don't do abs. Boy, I'm telling you, it's like, you know, they just won the lottery, <laughs> but they're laughing. They're smiling. They're leaving the room, you know, up. And that's all you can do. You can't control on the field or in meetings or what football coaches do or don't do. And, you know, the game itself, but, you know, you try to keep them working. Uh, you know, I make every four weeks during the season, I'll change the program a little bit and throw some variety in, go from, you know, eventually, I like, you know, I, I assume a lot of us, you know, as the latter part of the season comes, you lay off their legs a little bit more, you take the bar off their back and you go to deadlift or, you know, some form of something. And, uh, you know, th that perks them, believe it or not, they see that and that, that makes a difference. And then, then, like I said earlier, uh, I always end the groups with a talk. And I'm a, like I said earlier, too, I mean, I feel like in some of these cases, whether it's football or some of our other sports, I mean, sometimes they're pretty damn bad. And you got to be the psychologist. Right. And I'm, I'm, bringing, I'm bringing them up to where they hopefully hear something positive about the next game, the next day whatever it may be, and they leave with that understanding, and hopefully that helps. But it, it's, a, it's, it's really repetitive. I mean, we're, we're not over the hump by any means. And, you know, we won four games last year, so it's the most they've won in six years. Um, but, you know, it's by far not what we want. And, um, you know, but that, that has helped. We've gone into the offseason a little bit more higher, understanding that, but yet they understand they still got to work and, you know, we can get five or six maybe next year, you know, that type of thing. Yeah, it, it's a grind. Let me tell you. I mean, it's different. I mean, I've been, 
like I tell the kids, look, you've got to listen to me because I've been to the top. I've been on national championships. I've had, you know, Olympic athletes, you know, and, and, and I've been at the bottom. So I've seen it all the way up and all the way down. And, you know, these are the things you have to do, whether you're winning every game or you're losing every game. Some of this does not change. Well, I, it's got to go back to that mentality of just taking it day by day, right? I mean, that's kind of the, well, yeah. the ground base yep. of it. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. You, you can't worry. You know who you're playing next Saturday, but you can't worry about it. But today. Right. Love it, coach. And I want a couple more questions for you. Let's uh, let's sure, do your but... let's do your favorite professional development resources. Well, um, believe it or not, again, I'm a little old school, but I like a lot of emails, uh, sometimes phone calls. I, I read and read and read, whether it's the books or, you know, the Internet, just to see what is out there. And uh, kind of going into the question you asked way back at the beginning as far as where do you see the profession and, you know, coaches going, um, what I find, and, he, and here's an example, I'm part of the Collegiate Strength and Conditioning Coaches Association also, besides the NSCA, and we have a certification that the NSCA does, and it's a little more stricter. Uh, you've got to sit, you know, for the exam. Uh, you also have a practical and demonstrative portion. And what we, in probably the last four or five years, have really started to notice as far as the only people that can uh, work the exams are the master strength coaches. And so from all of us, when we sit and have these different candidates come to us, is that we find they're very ill-prepared. Um, not all, but it's more than what you'd hope for. And, and honestly, I don't know the exact numbers, but quite a few are flunking the exam. And, and they have to retake it and that kind of thing. So what we have found is that they're just not taking it serious enough. They're, they're, um, part of the exam is that you've got to design a program. And so we'll get things placed in front of us that, you know, this kid just pulled this thing off the Internet and you question them on it. And so what, what we find is that a lot of these kids are just looking at the internet and, and we, I've heard stories from colleagues all around that a lot of these young kids who might be your assistant, your GA, or maybe, you know, maybe a head person are just pulling workouts of the day and per, and presenting it to their teams. And so we're seeing more of that, and that that bothers us and me in the fact that, you know, I grew up with the mentors and, you know, grinding away reading and traveling and sitting down and watching a day or two of somebody training and asking questions till you just bug the hell out of them, but you learn from it. And then you start to formulate your philosophy over time and through working and what works, what doesn't work. I just don't think these kids today really understand that. There is a there is a difference. Now it's gotten a lot more technical because you've got so many, you know, good things out there with programming and this and that, you know, the GPSs and all that. But you know what? If you don't if you don't know how to use it or, you know, you don't you don't want to take the time to learn more, then none of that's going to help you. It's still sitting down and writing out you know, I mean, I still sit down every year, multiple times, write out, handwritten my workouts, scratch, throw out, put in until I like it, and then I print it. So, I mean, that to me is the way it still is, should be, because taking something off the internet or, you know, just calling somebody. I mean, I've heard stories where somebody's getting something faxed, emailed to them from somewhere else. And just printing that damn thing out, and and then their teams do it. It's just crazy to me. That's that's just not what I was raised with, and I don't think it's a proper way. Uh, and I don't. I hope that it's. You know, I, I'm not saying it's going to be the end all, but it, it's certainly something that's come up in the last number of years that we all have who have been in it 
obviously 10, 15, 20 or more years, see and and see it yearly. And, you know, hopefully that's something that somebody can correct, you know. Yeah, absolutely. That's That's got to be a huge issue. And it sounds like a really good way to get your athletes hurt and um, not doing the things that they need to be doing to, to perform the best that they can. And kind of the last question I have for you before we do our little finisher is – um, just, you know, I'm a young strength coach. So, you know, what is your advice for a young strength coach, whether they're just starting or they're in a head roll, just kind of starting a head roll, um, to get strength conditioning in the future where it needs to be and to continue the legacy that a lot of coaches have already established. What's your advice to us young strength coaches out here who are just kind of getting started? Well, you know, never stop learning. Definitely never stop learning no long no matter how long you've been in or will be in the profession. Uh, believe in what you do and believe it's right. Be open minded enough that if it's wrong, you know, you know, understand that you know you need to change it. Um, you know, keep mentoring not only your assistants or people that might be under you, but your athletes because society and what we're seeing I mean, we need these kids going out with a better understanding of what life is like and, you know, prepared that way rather than not. Um, you know, um, get involved in your profession. Get involved in the associations, whether it be the state, you know, regional, national, all of them, uh, you know, and, and and be a true professional. That's That's one thing also that I learned from, you know, starting out when it was really – new profession, but how a lot of the people I looked up to and mentors I talked to constantly, how they just dealt with their day-to-day -day job and how professional they were with it. And Coaching earlier on the high school level and some of the coaches I've been with were that way, and it's just part of coaching to be professional and, and, and not be doing something that's completely wrong and you know, that type of thing. Just just be involved. Uh, learn as much as you can. Don't feel like it's always greener on the other side. You know, um, when the time comes, you'll know if that job that you're going to possibly look at taking is the best or not. Sometimes sitting for another few years is good. All those kind of things. So it's just it's just being that much more involved in your profession. Awesome, Coach. I, I really appreciate your time today and, and all the awesome knowledge and advice you've shared with us. And let's finish here. Just three quick questions, and then we'll uh, we'll get you going. So, all right, first one here is you have 15 minutes to train for yourself. What are you doing? 15 minutes. Well, I'm going to definitely push, pull, and hinge. Um, how that might be is I might power clean. I might uh, – bench, incline, dumbbell work of some sort, squat, you know, just something big that I'm going to get the most bang for the buck out of it in that short period of time. Um, pretty much simple like that. Like it. Awesome. All right. What is your favorite office snack? I'm sure you spent hours in the office and what's your favorite hour uh, office snack? Well, uh, probably either yogurt or almonds. There you go. Simple again. I like it. All right, coach. Last one here. Um, small school strength coach who you think does a great job and uh, deserves a shout out. Well, I've got four for you and um, knowing them all and some of them better than others. Um, one, Corey Metzger, female, you know, which is unusual head strength coach at the Western Oregon University division two. Um, has been around different other places, known her through the profession for many years, a master coach, uh, does a tremendous job there. Uh, another one is Mike Dorscher at uh, Valdosta. Have known Mike for a long time, and he's stayed many, many years now at Valdosta and has paid off. And again, this last year with the Division II National Championship, does a solid job, work from uh, – you know, a dungeon closet to a beautiful elaborate room now they've had for a few years. Uh, Mike Cybernagel, University of Mary, 
Um, solid guy, knows his stuff. Just happened to, I think he's from the North Dakota area. Somehow, you know, over the years, just got into the Mary job and has put his stamp on it and, you know, has done a tremendous job there. Um, and then another guy is kind of like myself, you know, a dinosaur in the profession, has been at Humboldt State, Drew Peterson, for I don't know how many years. And they've just lost football, and he just keeps grinding it out and does a tremendous job with their kids and everything we talked about today with mentoring and developing and, you know, simple kind of stuff. So those are four that I would highly recommend, and I'm sure there's others, but those come to my mind. Awesome, Coach. I've, I've talked to Silver Nagel, and I've heard Metzger at a CSCCA a few years ago talk, and she was outstanding. And then um, definitely reach out and look into those other two as well. So really appreciate your time, Coach. Um, we'll put your email in the show notes if that's all right. All right. So if anybody wants to reach out to you and, yeah. and, and yeah. ask questions, they'll have that information, Coach. So, again, appreciate it, Coach. Good, rest, uh, good luck the rest of this spring, and, and take care. Same to you, Gage.